Okay, hello and welcome to another tutorial video. As you can see, this time we're going to be discussing real estate investment trusts or REITs and one of the key metrics associated with them called funds from operations or FFO. Now for all the files and resources here, you'll want to go to this URL on screen. I will pin this below the video as the first comment there. So you can just scroll down below the video and click the link in the comment, but just go to our REIT modeling category page and then funds-from-operations-FFO and you can get the Excel files and the PDFs and the screenshots and written version there. We've recently made available our REIT financial modeling course as a separate signup option. So if you don't care about properties and real estate modeling, you just want the REIT modeling, you can actually sign up for this separately now. And this is an excerpt or sample from that course. So what is funds from operations? As some background information, a real estate investment trust or REIT buys, sells, develops, and operates properties such as office buildings or apartment buildings or retail buildings or hospitals. Normal companies can do this as well, but the difference is that a REIT has to comply with special requirements. The most famous one being that it has to issue 90% of its net income as dividends in the US. And if it complies with these requirements, it is exempt from corporate taxes. There are others related to how much of its assets are related to real estate and its overall business activities and so on, but this is one of the most famous and important ones. So when you're analyzing a company like this that is constantly buying and selling and developing properties and also issuing a high amount of dividends relative to its net income, the analysis and the key metrics change. Funds from operations equals a REIT's net income plus its real estate related depreciation and amortization. Then you reverse the losses or gains on property sales and then you add back impairments and other types of losses. So if we go and look at our simple Excel file here, I've imported some financials for Avalon Bay, a leading multifamily or apartment REIT in the US. The FFO calculation would look something like this. We would start with the company's net income, which is simply at the bottom of their income statement. We would then go and add back their depreciation. Now there may be some depreciation that is not real estate related, but for a REIT like this, probably 99% of it is real estate related. So we're pretty safe adding back this number. Then we reverse the gains and losses because these are not really recurring items. They're probably not going to happen to this amount every single year. So we add them back as they're non-recurring. And then we can adjust for other types of losses such as casualty losses relating to insurance, maybe something related to FX or investments or other things like that. And that gives us the FFO number. The company provides its own and our estimates here are quite close to theirs. FFO is an improved version of net income that more accurately reflects the performance of a REIT and its ability to issue dividends. It does not replace cash flow based metrics like free cash flow or unlevered free cash flow. It's really an improved and more relevant version of net income. So you can't use it as a direct input into a DCF analysis, but it can be one of the steps you use to derive a metric like free cash flow or unlevered free cash flow. And to illustrate this, I've added this section in the Excel file that shows a couple different REIT specific metrics and some that are also not REIT specific. We have net operating income, we have funds from operations, we have unlevered free cash flow, and then we have free cash flow here. And funds from operations is about twice as high as normal free cash flow, and it's significantly higher than unleveraged free cash flow as well. So you can see how using FFO in a DCF and pretending that it's the same as one of these can give you very misleading results. You really can't do that. And if you do want to use FFO, you have to change around the analysis quite a bit. So that's the short version. Now here's what we're gonna cover in more depth if you want more details on any of this. I'm gonna start with why we use FFO for REITs. Then I will say a few things about using FFO to value REITs in real life. We'll talk about some differences under IFRS versus US GAAP because the REIT rules are different. Then we will do a comparison of FFO, free cash flow, and net operating income, and maybe some other metrics so you can understand those differences. And then we'll look at adjusted funds from operations or AFFO and some other variations of FFO that you'll see, especially outside the US. Let's start with the motivation and why we use FFO for REITs. For many normal companies, you often make dividends a percent of net income or after-tax profits in the projections. You can look at an example of this if you go to our tutorial on the dividend discount model. Now REITs have to distribute 90% or some other very high percentage of their net income as dividends to qualify for no corporate taxes or an extremely low corporate tax rate. So you might think that it makes perfect logical sense to make dividends a simple percent of net income for REITs. But the issue is that there's a bit of a paradox here because for a REIT, 
net income is not necessarily the best way to determine how much in dividends they can issue, and it's not necessarily the best way to drive those dividend projections. One issue is that big non-cash charges like depreciation and gains and losses can distort their earnings and make the REIT look much worse than it actually is. So let's go back here and I'll illustrate. If you look at Avalon Bay's income statement, if we just take this at face value, we have this very large expense here for depreciation. And if you look at the impact, overall, it reduces pre-tax income by something like 40% over what it would be without this depreciation. Meanwhile, we also have some very large charges here for gains and losses that make a pretty substantial impact too, maybe 25, 30, 35% impact on pre-tax income. The issue with this is that for a REIT, this depreciation item is almost meaningless because most properties actually rise in value over time. So yes, they have to replace things and upgrade and maintain the properties, all that's true, but Generally speaking, if they buy a property and then they go to sell it in the future, it's usually worth more, especially if it's done over a long period of time. Gains and losses are considered one-time items and they don't really affect a REIT's continued or ongoing ability to issue dividends, especially if they're selling properties that are very low yielding in the first place. So REITs often target a specific percentage of their funds from operations for their dividends. And then this ends up resulting in the dividends being over 90% or something close to that of net income. So in this example, if we were trying to project dividends, we would probably do it based on a percent of the company's FFO rather than as a percent of their net income. Let's talk about FFO in real life for valuing REITs. When you use public comps for REITs, you can certainly use metrics like EBITDA and the enterprise value to EBITDA multiple, but instead of net income and the PE multiple, you will use funds from operations and then the FFO multiple, which is just equity value divided by FFO. So if a REIT is growing its FFO more quickly than other similar REITs, theoretically it should trade at a higher FFO multiple. If we go into Excel and look at my other tab here for the public comps. So I have some multifamily REITs or apartment REITs in the US laid out right here. And I have EBITDA and EBITDA multiples. And if we take a quick look at them, and we look at some companies here that are growing their EBITDA and FFO more quickly, for example, it does seem like they trade at slightly more than the median multiples of the set. Although, frankly, these multiples are all in such a tight range, it's really hard to say. And even the growth rates are in a pretty tight range as well. But it does seem like there may be some relationship here. If we look at the company we're valuing, Avalon Bay, it's growing its FFO at a higher rate than the median for the public comps. And Indeed, they are trading at higher FFO multiples, but this doesn't really tell us anything too interesting. It's pretty much what we'd expect, slightly higher growth and slightly higher multiples. In practice, you'll find that this relationship doesn't always hold up that well for REITs because there are also differences in leverage, in development and acquisition activities, and you'll often see more variance if you split REITs into different subsectors like offices versus healthcare versus multifamily than if you strictly look at the FFO growth rates. Now, in terms of IFRS versus US GAAP, the biggest difference here is that under IFRS, REITs do not depreciate their properties. Instead, they actually revalue them in each period. So each quarter, each half year period, each year, and they record the unrealized gains and losses on their income statements. And so for non-US REITs, when you're calculating FFO, you have to add back or reverse both the realized and the unrealized gains and losses to calculate FFO because depreciation doesn't exist. And instead of this depreciation, which is very large for US Bay Streets, you have to factor in the unrealized gains and losses instead. Now, there are also metrics like EPR earnings for European REITs that are quite similar to FFO, but again, with the unrealized gains and losses instead, and also adjustments for things like deferred taxes. Let's take a quick look at an example here for this Australian REIT, Vicinity Centers in Australia. So they follow IFRS. And if you look at how they're calculating FFO, they are starting with the net property income. So essentially net operating income from their properties. They are factoring in fees. They're subtracting corporate overhead. They're subtracting the interest expense. All that's pretty standard. What's not standard is that if you look at the bridge between how they get from FFO to the net income or the net profit after taxes here, they don't have depreciation. Instead, they have a property revaluation line, and then they have a couple other lines relating to gains and losses on financial instruments and other items. The idea is similar, but the fact that they have property revaluation rather than depreciation makes things here look a little bit different. Let's now discuss FFO versus some other related metrics. 
So free cash flow is different because it fully deducts the reinvestment in the business via the change in working capital and CapEx. I have the standard formula for free cash flow right here, but let's go into Excel and take a quick look at this. So free cash flow would usually start with cash flow from operations for the company as we do here, and then it would deduct all forms of capital expenditures. Now for a REIT, this gets a little bit tricky because you're obviously going to deduct the recurring maintenance capex, but acquisitions, developments, redevelopments, non-real estate capex, some of these items are in the gray zone, but we would say that in general, you do want to factor in all these, and you also want to factor in the proceeds from asset dispositions because this is a recurring activity. REITs are constantly buying and selling properties, and so you want to reflect these proceeds in the free cash flow figures. If you look at this in our chart over here, you can see how as a result of these deductions for CapEx and also the change in working capital, free cash flow is much lower than funds from operations, and this will almost always be true for real estate investment trusts. FFO really understates the spending that's required for long-term growth, and so it's not comparable to free cash flow. Net operating income is another real estate specific metric. This is sort of like a property level EBITDA, and the way we calculate it here is we are just taking the REIT's property revenue, we're ignoring fees from other sources, and then we're subtracting the property operating expenses and the property taxes. And so this does not factor in the corporate overhead, the interest expense, not the depreciation, not the general and administrative expenses, basically nothing down here in corporate overhead and other expenses. So once again, this paints an even rosier picture than funds from operations because at least funds from operations has a deduction for the interest expense, but net operating income doesn't even have that. For the last part here, I'm going to discuss other variations of funds from operations. Probably the most famous one is adjusted funds from operations or AFFO. People normally define it as FFO minus recurring maintenance capex. Then you adjust for the amortization of lease intangibles and the straight lining of rent and some other adjustments that bring it a little bit closer to actual free cash flow. So the idea here is that since you are deducting the recurring maintenance capex on the existing properties, it gives you a better idea of what the REIT needs to spend and what it's generating from its existing properties after the maintenance costs required to keep them operational. AFFO tends to be the most useful for office, industrial, and retail REITs because there are multi-year leases in all these, and that creates sometimes a very large adjustment for the straight lining of rent. If we look at this Australian example for vicinity centers, you can see how they calculate AFFO by taking FFO and then deducting the maintenance capex, and then also the, the static tenant leasing costs here. They're essentially trying to make this reflect what they're really generating from their existing properties after these long-term maintenance costs. Now, AFFO still does not deduct the change in working capital or growth capex on new developments or new acquisitions or things like that. And so it's still higher than free cash flow and it's still not a direct input used in a DCF in most cases. Another issue is that every REIT calculates it a little bit differently. And that's a big problem with a lot of these metrics. And that's why we generally like to stick more closely to the standard ones like funds from operations that most people and companies agree on. Let's do a quick summary now why we use funds from operations for REITs. It gives a more accurate view of a REIT's overall operational performance. And, and since it adds back depreciation or unrealized gains and losses under IFRS and also adjusts for realized gains and losses, it is essentially an improved version of net income. To value REITs in real life, you can use FFO and you can make it into a valuation multiple equity value divided by FFO or the P to FFO multiple. If a REIT's growing its FFO more quickly, it should trade at a higher FFO multiple. Under IFRS, REITs do not depreciate their properties. Instead, they mark them to market value periodically. And so you make that adjustment instead of the depreciation adjustment as you would under US GAAP. With these other metrics, free cash flow is much lower because it deducts all CapEx, both maintenance and growth CapEx. Net operating income, on the other hand, is much higher because it does not deduct the corporate overhead and the net interest expense. And then there are other variations such as adjusted funds from operations that does deduct the recurring maintenance capex and sometimes other items like the straight lining of rent and amortization of lease intangibles and other things that make it a little bit closer to the REIT's actual cash flow. That's about it for this lesson. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about real estate investment trusts, how to value them and how to calculate this type of metric.